Hi there, I'm Keith Cauley, and this is Thrive, a Bridgestone America's podcast where we explore our company through compelling conversations with teammates across our organization. When we look at the history of Attire, there's been one constant across its innovation journey. It's pneumatic or filled with air. But as people think about mobility in the future, a frequent question we always get is when will we see non-pneumatic or air-free tires becoming common? Well, as you can imagine, it's something Bridgestone has been thinking about for quite some time. Air-free tires would be a significant solution for extended mobility, considering you don't have to worry about punctures or flats, air pressure problems, and more. Today, we'll be taking Thrive on the road to our America's Technology Center in Akron, Ohio, to talk with John Kimple, Vice President of our Extended Mobility Solutions business, and Brandon Nelson, a Manager of Advanced Extended Mobility Technology, about where we've been focusing our air-free tire development, what we've learned on the journey so far, and when we can expect to look around and see those air-free tires on the road. We hope you enjoy this conversation. Well, we are joined today uh, in Akron on the road uh, here for the uh, Thrive podcast, our, our, a trip up to our America's Technical Center in Akron, Ohio. Uh, and with us today is John Kimple. Uh, and John, you are the Vice President of Extended Mobility Solutions Business at Bridgestone. Is that correct? That is. Yeah. Awesome. Good to be here. Yeah. Thank you. Welcome. And with us as well is Brandon Nelson on John's team, Manager of Advanced Extended Mobility Technology. That is correct, right? Yes, sir. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. It's good to be here. Good to be out where the Mobility Lab at the America's Technical Center here in Northeast Ohio, a big footprint where we are driving the future of, of innovation in a variety of different ways. And one of the things that we're going to talk about today is one of the projects being uh, worked on and led here in Akron, and that is non-pneumatic tire, which for people who don't know what non-pneumatic is, that's okay, um, but that is fancy tech terms for airless tires, tires without air. That is correct? That is correct. For, uh, we're three for three You're so good. far You're on good. the start. Awesome. Well, let's, let's also start with each of you a little bit about your background, understand your journey, and how the world of air-free tires has come into your life. So, John, let's start with you. Yeah, great. Uh, so I've been with Bridgestone now going on 27 years. Hey! I know, hard to believe. <laughs> uh, and started off actually with industrial products. So I came and graduated with a mechanical engineering degree from Purdue. Came down to uh, Indianapolis and worked for industrial products, engineering, then went into sales. Uh, and then was with uh, industrial products for about 14 years. Mm -hmm. And then I went to building products actually for a bit. And so after 20 years with Bridgestone and not doing anything with tires, <laughs> I thought it was about time. And so I went to work and ran the marketing department for GCR. Uh, did that and then uh, got, the, uh, got the call, if you will, to, to go and, and, and be the leader for the Air Free project. And now I'm in the more of an expanded role as VP of Extended Mobility. So it's been a really, really good ride. There you go. Seeing a, a bunch of the different points of view across the business. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. Was there anything in your aspects uh, from maybe a technical or a product side in uh, industrial products, I mean, building products that, you know, maybe, mm -hmm. but uh, that made you ripe fit for kind of this project on non-pneumatic? Uh, well, whether it was industrial products or building products, and even within GCR, I would say that, you know, Bridgestone's always had this drive to be innovative. Mm -hmm. And again, whether, it, again, on the air spring side, we had that same kind of push. Even in building products, we had that same kind of push. Uh, but I would say when we started the first transformation with Gordon team, mm -hmm is when we really started to really invest in innovation as, a, as opposed to just being like a desire. And so taking that, you know, when we were, for lack of a better word, just, you know, attempting to, mm -hmm. we were truly investing in it. So just the prior experience with that, even so part of my experience before with industrial products was the business lead for ele electronically controlled air suspension. Yeah. So where can we go and take that, do something intelligent, kind of a foray, if you will, <laughs> into the mobility solution side of what we're doing today. Uh, but today we're, we're truly investing in it, having you know, teammates like Terrence Way and that, and that team, Michael Johnson's team, um, really applying that, that. We're in a whole different world now. And I would say the same type of approach with Airfree, truly the investment, we'll, we'll get in later, but yeah. even like back in 2017 when we made an acquisition of some technology, with it were uh that that primed me for you know just that that uh, the interest with it and again i have a engineering degree but i went into sales pretty quickly yeah and so that appreciation of taking a technology but where can you really go and, and solve a market need 
So my definition of marketing has been of how do you probably solve a customer's problem? Mm. And doing that from an innovative standpoint uh, is what I'm really passionate about. And it's also really awesome when you go and you take that and then you have really smart people like Brandon here to actually do the technology side. There so you go. I, I go and I find a problem and he gets to solve it. Yeah. There you go. That's the teamwork right <laughs> yeah. there, the whole holistic. Brandon, what about you? What's been your run at Bridgestone, but also just general career and journey wise? Yeah, I've not been here as long as John, that's for sure. But <laughs> We'll all get there someday. It's hard. Yeah, that's right. exactly. Slowly, I, I right. feel old now. I appreciate <laughs> that, Brandon. <laughs> That was our goal. In the yeah. first five minutes, yep. make John feel old. Check. We'll get there. It's yes, always done. my goal. Yeah. <laughs> so I've been here about eight years. Came out of an industry uh, creating equipment for construction sites. And, and it was, you know, really kind of stagnant in, in innovation. And I always wanted to push the limits. And yeah. I got a call from a buddy who was working here at Bridgestone, said, hey, do you want to come here? We have this program. I think at the time we could spend 10% of our time on any project we wanted. We got to choose it. And I was like, well, I'm, I'm in for that. <laughs> and so I came here and and we've always been focused on innovation, and Bridgestone's always let me innovate. And over the past eight years, I started off in TBR development, truck bus radial development, and, and sought to innovate as much as I could there. And it was always accepted by the business. And uh, four years ago or so, I got the opportunity to work on Air Free. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, it's been it's been a journey ever since. Yeah. So it's been fun to, to really create something new instead of just iterate on what already exists. And that's been a, a unique challenge. And leading a team through that has been has been a unique challenge as well. But we have a great team. So John gives me problems, and then I just, you know, <laughs> hand them off to the actual smart people. <laughs> but uh, yeah, we have we have a lot of fun doing it. Got a good process down that we're working. Absolutely. we're working everything through. Push it downstream, yeah. right? <laughs> well, and, and we like so we'll talk about the topic a little bit. And John, we talked to Christine Reagan on an earlier episode this season, and she's on your team of extended mm -hmm. mobility solutions, and that was focused on retreading, which I understand will will come into play here. But how does when we think about extended mobility solutions, for those who may not understand the dots that connect, how does air-free tires really fit into that world and how it fits into all the things your team is working on? Yeah, I can even go and with the extended side and even across the E8, and one of those yeah. E's being the extension. Mm -hmm. So with one thing you want to do is how do you extend, and this even gets into the sustainability side, of how do you reduce in terms of the actual how much material that you use. Mm -hmm. And the, the longer you can get a tire to last and to run, and even I'll get into the retread side of how long can you get the casing to live for, uh, that has a huge both a sustainable benefit from the environment as well as from a business standpoint. So it's a great TCO, total cost of ownership for a fleet, but also you're not going and taking materials and, and having to build something new, if you will, in terms of the whole, the whole carcass, the whole casing, you're just retreading it. Um, so in terms of extending, just extending the life of that casing. And part of what we looked at in terms of the whole value proposition is what's causing a casing to not last as long as what we think it should. Mm -hmm. And underinflation is a big one. Crown punctures is a big one. And so if you go and you take and you remove that variable of error, again, you remove in, under inflation and you remove the, the issue of the crown, crown puncture. So therefore extending it. So it's a, and I'd also say in terms of the whole value proposition, again, being good for sustainability as well as for business, that the more that you can go and retread something, the better off you're gonna be. So retread is actually a really critical part of the value proposition of air free. Mm -hmm. Uh, this is not going to be a less expensive alternative <laughs> if you're adding material to it. So just intuitively, it's going to be more expensive. So you really do need to have retread to be part of it, yeah. to be part of the value prop. Well, and as we look at making an air-free tire, I mean, the, the case is clear for the benefits from a performance and, a, and, like you said, extension. Like it's a little bit of safety. You're not needing to worry about the maintenance and, and punctures and being left on the side of the road or be put in dangerous situations. So in that sense, you're like, yeah, we should be making air-free tires. And then, you know, we got materials out there. You you make it without air and it's a big brick and you put it on a car and you roll. Yeah. But it's very, uh, you know, what are the things that you need to worry about then? And why is this so hard, I guess, Brandon, to solve that problem to make an air-free tire that is viable? That's the performance. And what type of performance do we need it to deliver? Yeah, it, it's, a, it's a very challenging problem. And one of the things we don't realize about air tires, <laughs> if you want to call them that, right? Pneumatic tires is that the air does 80% of the work hmm. in carrying the load and it's very efficient and it's free <laughs> and it's lightweight and there's all these benefits to it. So when you try to take it out of the, the tire itself, you have to replace that with something. And so the materials are now doing the work and we have a lot of really strong, really great materials out there to choose from. 
but yeah. they're they're not that strong yet, <laughs> right? So we, we're at a unique moment in time, I think, where where the materials and the technology are starting to come together to make this possible, but it's still at the, the cutting edge. It's the tip of the spear, and so it's, it's very challenging to make it all work together. Yeah, and it's a nice like little science lesson, I think, for people seeing air as part of the the mix and the properties of what makes the tire performance and it's it's whatever deliverable in that sense. We usually just think that's we need it to fill up so that it, it rides better or something, but it's all part of the holistic it tire is. experience. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. It's critical. Yeah. Well, we, we ventured in, I, I think some of the people who've worked for, for Bridgestone for a little bit maybe saw the initial air-free conversation in Japan. Uh, they introduced an air-free bicycle mm -hmm. uh, a couple of years ago, and we're trying to perfect that. Uh, we've done air-free tires uh, through the, the Tokyo Olympics uh, in, in Japan uh, on some small Toyota vehicles that kind of looked like Segways, and they were kind of personal mm -hmm. mobility things. So at a very small scale, low speed, low weight, right? We're looking at air free here in the Americas in a little bit of a different way. How did we, I guess, assess where we wanted to focus air free and how did we end up uh, where we are and where are we, yeah. John? Yeah, yeah it's, a, it's a great question because it's, and Brandon asked us <laughs> from the very beginning, like, you, did we really have to pick the most difficult application? <laughs> Why not? Yeah, Let's exactly. Let's challenge ourselves. Because I thought there was a market there. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Uh, but yeah, we, so, you know, as you said, Bridgestone Japan working on the, for the, the bicycle side. And in fact, the technology we bought uh, in 2017 was from Polaris, as in like the ATV hmm. company. And they were using AirFree for a uh, ATV application, uh, a lot of military as well. But again, it was what each one carried 800 pounds, something like that, Brandon. Something like that. And ballpark. went 35 miles per hour. Uh, but we then took a look at, okay, where is there truly a market need you can go after in terms of what's technically viable with, you know, some kind of technology today. Um, even like on solid tires, like you'll see on, um, on telehandlers, et cetera, you'll see these solid tires that they kind of look like there's holes in them. Uh, and there are, but it's more for just to help with the molding process. Um, so there are some things we could do again, low speed applications. But we took a look at, okay, what about the waste application? What about underground mining? What about, again, truck or trailer? What about autonomous? Uh, what even about, you know, do we use this as the next version of run flat? Mm -hmm. And then we said, okay, well, what problems does air free actually address? And then what's the addressable market? Because even with, even on the trailer or TBR application, it's not going to be every single trailer is going to have it. We first said it's probably going to be more of the sophisticated fleets that truly measure a total cost of ownership or cents or dollars per mile. So we went and segmented that. And then that's when we decided, okay, we think first off, we have a technology that's viable that can get into that trailer application. And we even picked the trailer side uh, because about 60% of the emergency roadside situations are because of a trailer hmm. uh, tire issue. It's very poorly maintained, underinflated, et cetera. So that's why we went and picked the trailer side. What's nice is uh, the fact that, you know, from a, you know, what the impact of a drive application or a steer, the trailer doesn't see that as much. So it's a good place to start off with the trailer that we can then take to the drive and then to the, to the steer. Technically though, <laughs> again, it's, there's about 120 PSI of air. So there's a lot of pressure and a lot of work that that air is doing. So I can't say that Brandon went and said, that's perfect. <laughs> that's, that's exactly, thank you very much, Kempel, for, for that recommendation. Uh, but we started off in, in the very beginning of don't short putt. Yeah. Yeah. Meaning don't go and just kind of like go what's easy. Go with what there's an addressable market for. And if we can start off there, it's also difficult. We realize that. But then it's easier for us to go and take that base technology and even the material science and the modeling behind it. Mm. And then, okay, now let's talk about some of these emerging OEs as an example, or how about the waste segment? We can go and then, you know, trailer isn't the final destination, it's the start. Yeah. But it gives us a base technically where we can go to other places. But yeah, it was it was not, you know, the team's been awesome and they'll take the challenge. They did not short putt. Yeah. But it wasn't. <laughs> no, it, it hasn't been an easy ride, but it's been a good one. I mean, where we started with the Resilient Technologies tire that we purchased, I mean, it was a great tire oh, yeah. for that application and yeah. it works to this day. Uh, unfortunately, you can't scale it up. It's not a mass market. Right, yeah. yeah. If you scale that up to the size of a, a truck tire, TBR <laughs> tire, there, there's some major issues immediately come to the fore. And, and we, we saw that 
really quite early on when we started testing that tire, but it gave us a springboard to jump to that next technology. Where do we need to go? And that, t- that trailer tire being our North Star, it really got us to aim higher. And yeah. so we, we know we can scale that technology down, but it's really hard when you have a solution that's set for something of a, like a lower energy density to scale that up and be successful. Well, I, I was, that was going to be one of my next questions was it, it, these are, we talk about real investment and in innovation. This in particular is probably not something you get right. You're not going to get any of this stuff right on the first try. No. Uh, so what has this kind of iteration process been like? I guess, how long have we kind of been working and what have been the stages, I guess, of learning, of pivoting, of evolving the strategy forward or the approach? Yeah, it's, it's definitely been a journey. And, and as you, hindsight's always twenty twenty. Sure. So you look back and you're like, well, why did it take so long to figure <laughs> that out? But, you know, the reality is until you do it, until you start diving into the problem, uh, you don't know what you don't know. And so in the beginning, it really looked like quickly iterating and creating prototypes and getting out there to test physically so that we can realize what are these main hurdles we're running into. And over the years, it started to progress into maybe taking a little bit longer between iterations, although the team's probably going to laugh when they hear me say that. They still feel like we're going, you know, a thousand miles an hour, which we are, but uh, we, we are changing how we design we're being more meticulous with how we design. We're utilizing our virtual tools in, in a way that we have never used before. Uh, and and we're creating uh, just new, a, a stronger technology every day. How do you, how do you um, I guess, keep the team? It's It's got to be a mindset, right? And we've talked about this with a couple of different people and more often in that innovation space where you have to set different targets that you're meeting. I mean, I have like, I get distracted by chipmunks and squirrels and everything. And so I, I, what did I do today? Let's check it off the list. That's my, my achiever in my, my strength performer stuff right there. But I mean, how do you do that as a mindset, right? That you're like, we're kind of in this for bad pun long haul. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and you're going to go through some stuff where you're going to have to stop and maybe take a step back to then go a couple of steps forward. It's got to be grueling at times, but uh, the payoff, I guess, is what drives you, right? It does, I think. And, and it depends. Different people have different personalities sure. and how they approach work, obviously. <laughs> but, you know, there have been seasons of, of just uh, uh, the team is, is fully on board, fully in it. And then we hit a wall, right? <laughs> Which we have many times. We've we've had to scrap projects that we've worked for months on and people put so much effort into and then all of a sudden that didn't work, <laughs> right? And we have to totally change course. And you know, in those times, I think it's important for us to re- yeah, remember that end goal, remember where we're moving towards and look to what we've learned even in that failure. Because even in the midst of designing something that you end up putting on the shelf, you've learned a significant amount on how to design that part of the process or whatever it might be that we can apply to the next time we do that. And that next time is going to be that much easier and that much faster and that much better. That that was one thing early on, though, of we didn't want the team to think of it as a failure. Now, if you keep on doing the same thing over and over again, okay, maybe I'll call it that. (laughs) But it was more about learning. Yeah. And so that whole, like, you know, the learn fast part of it, and we talked about, you know, like, you know, treating these more like roundabouts, if you will, or decision points, not as a gate. And to go from like early on, it was a thermoplastic, so plastic web. Okay, what did we learn from that? Okay, that doesn't work out. Okay, well, let's, what material properties do we need? So we went around the roundabout, came back, and then moved forward. I'd also say a couple of different things. One, using outside expertise. Mm-hmm. So to go and look at some, like within the aerospace industry, other parts of the automotive industry, material science. So all this in terms of like, again, like the, um, you know, the co-development with it and using outside expertise, brand and team have done an excellent job with that. Um, I'd also say Brandon's demeanor and just in general, if you want to be an innovator, um, the highs and lows, if you can go and manage that, and be more even keel. He, he's done an excellent job with that. Be very pragmatic, objective about it. Um, but also the uh, the modeling side is, and I'll let you talk about that. But you've you've built virtual, I mean, you know, amazing amount of virtual prototypes in a short period of time. Yeah, yeah. And when we say you, he means <laughs> Dr. Ben Ramai and Brad Plaza. Exactly. And, yeah, we're you know, they got the name drop <laughs> uh, Ben and Brad. I gotta, I gotta give him some credit, obviously. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, the virtual tools have been huge in how we've developed, and, and over the past couple of years, 
we've really started to utilize AWS, you know, Amazon Web Services, and their cloud-based infrastructure. So you know, right now we we utilize on-prem resources, or we have historically we have a set number of of servers that we can run our models on. And these models that we're creating now are are huge. I mean, we're talking about a all of the elements in the tire plus a full suspension system on a truck plus hitting objects on the roadway and it's yeah. a it's a large model uh, but that team has been able to develop it in a way that it runs quickly it gives us reliable results and then com coupling that with amazon and you know, we're able to run thousands of iterations mm -hmm. in weeks and that's that's game changing because before we're running you know an iteration here we're thinking about it an iteration there and we would never have found the solution because you're just wandering in the dark, so to speak, right? So now we have this ability to map the whole space and all of a sudden we can say, oh, there's where we need to be. And that's what we've been doing iteration over iteration over iteration for the past year or so. And we've gone from a tire that had a rolling resistance of 30. And if you're familiar with tires at all, I mean, that's, that's unheard of. The tire actually would light on fire at that point right <laughs> down the road. A, fire, a, th a thermal event. <laughs> and, and, <laughs> a thermal. and we've proven this in testing, yes? That would yeah, be a yeah, fun, sure. fun yeah, thing yeah, to yeah. do. Yeah, yeah. yeah sure. So, so the first tire that we did was pretty thick, <laughs> and it lasted maybe minutes. <laughs> <laughs> but now we're at a, we're at a potentially right industry-leading rolling resistance, even among pneumatic tires. Huh. So, so that's, a, that's a feat. That's, that's impressive. What so and I guess when you think about all of the things you have to address, what have been the when somebody says what are the challenges of an of a non pneumatic tire versus a pneumatic that you have to address? What is that list and how do we go about uh, solving them? Yeah, that's great, and I think it de it depends on which market you're App trying to approach. It, right, it sure. really depends on the application, and I think this is where uh, what we're doing is different than what we see other competitors doing in the marketplace right now. And so what we're really focused on from the beginning is is honestly rolling resistance, is getting a tire that can go down the road without lighting on fire. <laughs> I should stop saying that word, right? <laughs> no, but, it's, it's something we're going to avoid and we're committed exactly. to avoiding right, it. We're Fantastic. Avoiding that. But I mean, getting a tire that actually is, is fuel efficient, that's one of the biggest drawbacks. When we start to use materials to carry the load, naturally most materials and most materials that flex enough to be a tire are going to be lossy yeah. and they're going to drag as you go down the road. So uh, we focused on that from the very beginning, going to lossless materials. But as you go to lossless materials, uh, a lot of what happens is you start to have trouble handling impacts, handling uh, you know natural undulations in the road. And so that's been a lot of our focus over the past few years is, is making those materials which give us the efficiency we need also be robust enough to handle what they're, they're going to see out in the road. What do you hear from partners when you go out? I know a couple of years ago, it was right before kind of the, the COVID hit, we were starting to showcase, I guess, this path to some of our commercial partners and, and tell them that this was coming. What's been kind of that reaction and conversations that you get when you talk to our customers? So especially on the fleet side, very, very engaged. Yeah. Um, to the point of when can I have it? I need it now type of thing. <laughs> g g give me updates. Sure. <laughs> um, and that's whether it's like on the, on the application that we're going after. So very, very engaged. They see the value prop, even at a higher price point, they see that return on their investment. Uh, and then there's other areas, like I said, you, we can go and put this in the last mile side. We can go and put it more in the emerging OEs, uh, robo taxis, et cetera. So we're getting a lot of pull as well of when can I have that technology for these other areas? And that's something that we need to, because you can drown an opportunity and you can lose focus on what, what you mentioned, Keith, mm -hmm. of how do you remain you know, focused on and solving the problem. Um, so we, we need to map out, okay, when we get that baseline of material science and modeling, then we can go to other areas because there is quite a bit of interest out there. Well, I guess to that question then, in general speaking, I don't know what timelines and what proprietary plans are, but where are we in the journey to make that available to customers? Yeah. Do you want to answer so you're accountable yeah. to it, Brandon? No. <laughs> so uh, we're, we're actually, putting it down. It, yeah. it will hold as ink yeah, right here. Right. This is all of it, right? Yeah. Uh, Paulo and Nazar. <laughs> uh, so actually, uh, this year, the, the you know later this year, we're actually going to be testing again at TPG. And then the, the Texas Proving Ground. Te Texas so, yep. Proving Ground. Yep, exactly right. Um, and that's after doing thorough lab testing here within uh, ATC. And we even start off before then with uh, a component level validation as well. So we, then we build up to a full scale. And then next year in 2023, we want to do more fleet trials. And then by 2025, we're doing more of a controlled launch 
with those fleets. So it's it's becoming very, very real. If we were to look at then industry-wide and, and zoom out kind of to wrap up the conversation of what does the five to 10 years down the road, maybe not just for a commercial trailer trucking application, but is this, I, can, I guess the natural question, right? Is like, when will I get an air-free tire on the car I drive? Like, is that a realistic path in the industry moving forward? Even just, not just us, but just as you see that. And then my other question was related to like what we do with mobility solutions. And we're talking about putting sensors in the tire and making it more connected. Does an air-free uh, structure of a tire open up more or different or better opportunities to embed sensors and do that as we move forward into the future? So I'll, I'll do in terms of the like the 10 years. At, the the big with in terms of, I do think you have to look at it from you know almost looking at it with the with the E8 in mind in terms of it does help you from an ecology standpoint an efficiency standpoint extension standpoint um, I would even go and suggest even from a motion standpoint mm -hmm. uh, of what air free can provide you and that is going to go and extend to other areas I do think especially initially even within a ten year sp a span you'll be looking at still more fleet applications. Mm -hmm. But those fleets are going to get into, um, you know, again, like robo taxis, people movers, uh, you know, more of the autonomous side. I can see that, uh, you know, that playing a big role. And we've seen that even from feedback from NHTSA. So part yeah. of this is regulatory. You know, how do you go and approach it? And uh, they're very, very interested because, again, NHTSA regulatory authorities are pushing for autonomous from a safety standpoint. And you know the, the maintenance of the tire when you start removing a driver mm. you know you only have limited maintenance when you do have a driver <laughs> you remove that and that decreases that much more so i do think that there's gonna be a push on in that end for for air free technology yeah. Yeah. we can talk more about that yeah i mean we, we we are definitely looking at air free holistically from a solutions business from a sustainability side yeah. and as we see you know the the advancements we're making in our casing health models for example as we see the advances we're making in our wear models, we do expect to, to work to implement those over the years into air free. I don't know if the structure necessarily lends itself to any sort of better mm -hmm. you know, methodology, so to speak, but it has its own unique challenges and unique sure. needs. And, and one of the things that you know, we, we are exploring even actively is how we can make sure that you know when your air free tire is having an issue, right? Now, air, air actually allows you to know when your when your pneumatic tires having an issue, and so having that predictive uh, maintenance capability and that, I guess, early warning system is something that we're looking into. Gotcha. Well, you've heard it here that within the next uh, year we'll be in robo taxis, autonomous driving <laughs> cars that are on air free tires, which is the next stage to flying cars, which the team is also working on. So this is great. Absolutely. It's really yeah, it's really good it. to, to yeah. see all this come together. <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, but but thank you guys both for the time. I mean it's it's a fun conversation. It is a a topic that I think a lot of teammates have always been curious about. If you look around the industry, it's like where is this a more tangible part of the future? I think to a lot of people because yeah that would be a next step in tires, but tires have kind of been the way that they are for a century, it yeah. seems, right? So this would be a, a quite a step forward. But John, thanks for the time. Brandon, well, thank thanks you. for the time. Appreciate the conversation. Yeah, thank, thank you. It's been fun. Thank you. Now, non-pneumatic tires are just one of the many key extended mobility concepts we're continuing to focus on at Bridgestone. As noted, one of the others is retreading, which would be closely connected to the air-free tires that we would be bringing to market. If you want to learn more about retreading or revisit the conversation, you can check out our episode on bandag and retreading from earlier this season. Of course, you can find that wherever it is you prefer to listen to podcasts. While there, remember to give us a rating or a review, and remember you can also watch all of our Season 3 episodes on the Bridgestone America's YouTube page. Or you can reach us via email with a question, topic idea, or share some feedback. Just send a note to thrivepodcast at bfusa.com. Thanks for listening. I'm Keith Colley, as always, reminding you to keep on keeping on. And remember that at Bridgestone, today, tomorrow, together, we thrive. Be good, everybody.